The following message was delivered at Westminster Orthodox Presbyterian Church in Bartlesville, Oklahoma on May 5, 2024. The speaker is Mr. James Hyder, a ruling elder. The message is based upon Hebrews chapter 9 verse 23 through chapter 10 verse 18, and it is titled, Christ Saves His People. Hebrews chapter 9, starting at verse 23. Thus it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer him self repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy place every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to have suffered repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, So Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, they would not have ceased to be offered. Sorry, would they not have ceased to be offered? Since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written in me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that, we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. For by the time, for by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them, After those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law on their hearts and write them on their minds. And then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. And all God's people said, you may be seated. So, Our passage this morning covers a lot of ground, and the reason for that is because the author of Hebrews is restating and reiterating the things that he has spent the previous nine chapters laying out for us. Remember, the book of Hebrews is deep theology in the service of faithful living, and so the author of the book of Hebrews has a burden for his audience. He doesn't want to just educate. He doesn't want to just inform. He wants to convince you of the necessity of living lives of grateful obedience to Jesus Christ. So if you look at the book as a whole, 
The first ten chapters speak about things like the superiority of Christ, the superiority of the new covenant over the old, the once-for-all sacrifice of Christ on the cross, his high priestly work of intercession, the passing away of the old covenant system of sacrifices. These are deep and beautiful theological truths for God's people, with exhortations to faithfulness sprinkled throughout. But in chapter 11, we see a transition to more explicit calls to faith and endurance on the basis of everything that has come before. This call to endurance isn't legalism or platitudes, but rather it is directly based on the theology that has been laid out for us already, on the solid theological foundation of the new covenant in Christ's blood. The author lays stone after stone in this wall in order to exhort his hearers to faithfulness and endurance. Which is why what we have before us today is his reiteration of that argument before his transition to this robust call to faithfulness and endurance. He's restating what he has already said. So, because of that, today will be a review of several conclusions that have come before. And today we'll cover a lot of text. But it should be familiar ground for all of us who have worked through Hebrews together. And so we will look at this passage in three parts. Salvation in Christ, necessary changes, and finally, God's sinless people. Again, that's salvation in Christ, necessary changes, and God's sinless people. First, salvation in Christ. We start, once again, with a very familiar connecting word, thus. Based on everything that has come before, thus, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Because of the pattern revealed in the old covenant system of the necessity of shedding blood for purification, for the forgiveness of sins. The blood of Christ was necessary, not merely to purify the pale earthly reflections of the heavenly reality, but to purify the heavenly reality itself. Because once again, we see here that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, while reflecting the nature of old covenant sacrifices, is of a completely different order it is utterly different when it comes to how effective it is. Not only does the blood of Christ deal with the heavenly realities, but it does so in a complete way, in a final way. What Christ did on the cross does not ever need to be repeated. He shed his blood as a sacrifice for sins, and that blood was accepted. That sacrifice was accepted. The job is done forever. It is finished. Think of how grotesque it would be otherwise. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood not his own. For then, he, meaning Jesus, would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. If the blood of Christ was not completely sufficient to wipe away all the sins of his people once and for all, then he would have had to be sacrificed continually, to suffer continually, to be crucified continually. Every sin committed by every single one of his chosen people would require a fresh crucifixion, a fresh sacrifice and spilling of our Savior's blood to cover it. He would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. 
Matthew Henry puts it like this, saying, Christ's sacrifice, that being once offered, it was sufficient to all the ends of it. And indeed, the contrary would have been absurd. For then he must have been still dying and rising again, and ascending, and then again descending and dying. And the great work would have been always doing, always to do, but never finished which would have been contrary to reason as to revelation and to the dignity of his person. It would be absurd to say that the blood of Christ was not sufficient once and for all. It would be an offense to the character of God. Everything we know about the person and work of Christ tells us that his blood is enough. It has satisfied divine wrath for his people. He has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. The world that began, the very moment that Adam sinned, sorry, when Adam was created, ended when Christ died on the cross. Those were the bookends of history, the beginning and end of an age. That is why the age we live in is called these last days, because it is not what the age we live in now is the dawning of a new creation. You and I in Christ are members of a fundamentally different world. Now, don't get me wrong. In this life, we still live with the lingering effects of the curse on sin. Even though you confess Christ, You will still suffer and die in this life. But this world, with all of its suffering and death, is no longer your home. You are a citizen by blood and by right of a new creation. God's people are merely pilgrim wanderers in this world of death and decay. Our true home is the new heavens and the new earth. And it is here now in Christ in the heavenly places and will be revealed even more fully on the judgment day when Christ appears and applies the fruits of his victory against sin and death once and for all by punishing the wicked and rewarding the faithful in Christ. That is the day when we will see the fullness of this beautiful reality. Which is why the author goes on to say, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. When Christ comes again, it will be to fully reveal to all creation what he has accomplished on the cross. But his second coming will not be to deal with sin, but rather to deal with salvation, the salvation of his people, the full, final, true, eternal, everlasting, indestructible salvation of his people, where we are raised to glory, never to die again, where every tear is wiped away, never to reappear where every frailty, weakness, and sin is put away once and for all, and all will serve God with all of their hearts forevermore. But some may object. Isn't the day when Christ returns also called the judgment day? Why does the author of Hebrews say that he will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him? Well, The scriptures answer that question, that objection. In John 3, those very familiar verses continue. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his world into the son to, in his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. 
The coming of Christ was for the salvation of his people. He came, he lived a perfect life, and he died a perfect death to atone for sins once and for all. When he comes again, it will be for the full revealing of the salvation that he has accomplished. And as part of that full revealing, it will involve a separation of his people from the rest of the world who has rejected him. Those people who are dead in their sins and trespasses. The sacrifices have already been made. The victory has already been won. Salvation has already been purchased once for all by the sacrifice of Christ and the shedding of his worthy blood on the cross. Look at how Revelation chapter 1 speaks about that day. 21, Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He shall dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more. For the former things have passed away. That salvation has been accomplished. And on that day, it will be fully revealed. And because salvation has been accomplished, several things had to change for God's people. Which brings us to our next point, necessary changes. The author of Hebrews wants his audience to have hope in Christ, to have full assurance of their salvation and full peace of their conscience. He wants them to know the magnitude of the depth and breadth of everything that Jesus Christ has done for them. Specifically, he wants them to be free from their obligation to continue the Jewish Old Covenant sacrificial system. And he explains this to them by saying at great length why it was an inferior system that has now passed away in Christ. For since the law was but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered, since the worshippers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins? It is a simple argument. If the Old Covenant sacrificial system worked to bring about the perfection of God's people and the purification of their consciences, it would have ceased by its very nature because it would have fulfilled its mission and no longer been necessary. Rather, what we see in the Old Covenant system is called a reminder of sins every year. Because, and it goes on to say, it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Because of that fact, that system could never fully deal with the problem of sin. Rather, what it did was continually remind God's people over and over and over again of their need for a Messiah. Each and every sacrifice pointed them forward to the better sacrifice to come. There, it pointed them to their need for a true and final sacrifice for their sins that would fix the problem of fallen humanity once and for all. And yet, that sacrificial system was never able to offer anything more than a reminder of their greater need. Indeed, we are explicitly told that the old covenant system was never meant through the, through the external sacrifices to bring about the salvation of God's people. The author of Hebrews quotes here saying, 
You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings. These are offered according to the law. Now, don't misunderstand me. God accepted those sacrifices by his grace and mercy because he was the one who had commanded them to be made. He had commanded his people to offer those sacrifices in the humility of their hearts. And so when they obeyed, he accepted them. But it was not the sacrifice, the external thing that was being accepted. Rather, it was their faith that was being counted to them as righteousness. Again, look to the words of David in Psalm 51. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit and a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. What God has always required from his people is hearts that acknowledge the ugliness of their sin and flee unto God for their righteousness. Men and women who despise their own ability to save themselves and cling unto God alone for salvation. Salvation is by grace, through faith, in Christ. And so the reason that the old covenant system had to be done away with was not simply because it was insufficient, but because it was inherently contradictory with the new covenant system. Don't get me wrong, that's a strong statement. God does not change. It was the same God offering his people salvation um, by grace through faith in Christ in the old covenant as he was offering it to them in the new covenant. When I say that they are contradictory, what I mean is that in the old covenant, we read that there is a reminder of sins every year. God's people are reminded over and over and over again of their need for a savior. They make sacrifices of blood and goats, not to purify their consciences and wash away their sins, but to remind themselves of their need for a savior. But that system has changed. Christ has come. His blood has been shed as a once-for-all sacrifice for his people. He has done away with the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. In the Old Covenant, there is this continual reminder of the sins of the people. In the New Covenant, we have a continual reminder that our sins are covered in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look to the words of Christ as recorded in Mark chapter 14. As they were eating, he took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. That is the nature and the beauty of new covenant worship. We do not offer sacrifices continually to remind us of our need. Rather, God's people joyfully partake in the Lord's Supper to remind us of that once for all sacrifice that he made for us on the cross. In the New Covenant, we don't look forward with desperate longing. Rather, we look backwards with joyful gratefulness. We remember Christ's sacrifice once for all and put all of our hope and trust and faith in him and in his blood. The whole process has been taken completely out of our hands. And because of that, we have no more external sacrifices to make. Rather, the only sacrifices the new covenant people of God make are those of the heart. And God uses the humble and contrite heart that he gives to bring about our sanctification. Which brings us to our final point. 
God's sinless people. In the same way that the people of God's method of worshiping God has rightly changed, so too have God's people been changed. We read that every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. By a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. That right there is the beauty and glory and hope of the gospel in one compact sentence. Christ has accomplished salvation and part of salvation for his people is our perfection. We are not a broken and defeated enemy of God because of the cross. Rather, as it says in Ephesians, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom you once lived in the passions of your flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. It was a bad state. We were dead in our sins, rebellious against God. And yet, that passage in Ephesians continues saying, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith. The once for all sacrifice by Christ on the cross is effective. It has done its work Glory of glory, sin has been dealt with, and we have been born again in his blood. That means that we have been forgiven for our sins, and we have been made perfect in him. And also that we are being made perfect day by day, that already and not yet of the Christian life. We are seated with Christ in the heavenly places as a present reality. And yet, we eagerly await the coming of Christ on the last day in order to come into the full joy of our perfection in Christ. Look at the beauty of the promise of the gospel for in the new covenant. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law on their hearts and write them on their minds. And he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. He will act. He will do it. God will transform us completely into men and women who love him perfectly, who obey him perfectly. And again, Because we have been made perfect in Christ, there is no need for continuing sacrifice. No need for reminders of sins. Because, we are told, where there is forgiveness of sins, there is no longer any offering for sin. Brothers and sisters, that in Christ is where we are. We have forgiveness of sins in his blood. And so we offer no more sacrifices. We merely remember his sacrifice and wait with eager anticipation for the return of our Lord to set all things right. We long for the day described in Revelation 22, where it says, No longer will there be anything accursed 
but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and night will be no more. There will need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord their God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your kindness to us. We thank you for the incredible gift of salvation through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you that it is not merely a matter of how we feel, but it truly changes our hearts. It truly changes our eternal destiny. It changes our citizenship from that of hell to that of heaven. Lord God, in the Lord Jesus Christ, things truly change once and for all. And so, Father, we pray that we would live lives that remember that, live lives of grateful, joyful obedience unto you and unto your law. Please support us and strengthen us and send your spirit to teach us and guide us this week. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. For more sermons like the one you just heard, visit westminsterbartlesville.org or join us at 1030 in the morning every Lord's Day. We're located on the corner of Adams and Chickasaw in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. We'd be happy to have you.